All right. Well, everybody, welcome back. I uh, hope you all had a, a great uh, week. And uh, <clears throat> we are, uh, last week, of course, we closed out chapter two of Acts. And so this week we're, we're transitioning now into chapter three. And uh, chapter three, uh, really, it, it is centered around one uh, one specific event that takes place and uh, and sort of what led up to that event and then the repercussions that the event had because it had some major repercussions uh, in and around the temple, in and around uh, the Jewish society, even Roman society. And uh, it opened the door for many new opportunities for the apostles to share uh, the word of Christ to other people. So today we're going to start reading this uh, about this event and, uh, and see how the Lord speaks to us. Before we do that, we're going to uh, take a moment and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. So let's go ahead and bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we're excited to hear more of what you have done. Father, we're excited to, to hear from your Holy Spirit as you teach us the truth as you reveal new uh, and, and greater understanding. And Father, I pray right now as we go into this word that it, your, that it is your Holy Spirit who will speak, who will teach, and who will give us the discernment that we need. Father, we thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with all that said, we're going to go ahead and dive right into it. We're, we're, we're going to be in uh, chapter 3. We're going to read verse 1 as we kick off this new chapter. It says this, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. So, uh, Peter and John were going to the temple. We know uh, from what we had just read in chapter two that the disciples were meeting in the temple every single day. And in this verse, it says that Peter and John were going not just um, you know, when they woke up or when they had finished their chores, whatever. They were going at a specific time of the day, which is defined as the time of prayer. And this is indicated at, uh, to be at three in the afternoon. Now, in the context of what we're reading, the, the Jewish uh, people who were devout would have gone to the temple three times a day to engage in prayer, specific prayer at the temple. And uh, one of those times um, was three o'clock. It was the three o'clock prayer. This was the second prayer of the day that would have taken place at the temple for those who truly were devout in, in their beliefs as a Jewish person. Now, <clears throat> When we put this together, we can see that this was probably, uh, this would have, not probably, but this was absolutely true. This was a daily routine of Peter and John, along with the other disciples who were part of, uh, of their group. Every day at three, they would have walked to the temple at the same time, and the majority of times, uh, they would have been taking the same path that they would have taken. Uh, it was uh, similar to if you go to uh, church on Sunday morning and you, you get up and you, you get in your car or whatever and you start driving to church, 99% of the time, I bet you would all say, hey, I, I tend to take pretty much the same roads every day that I, every Sunday, every time I go to church or every time you go to work, wherever you go, you end up taking the same path. It, it becomes a routine. This is an important detail that, uh, that's going to give us some greater meaning as we progress through this story. So Peter and John have this routine. They go through the same place at the same time. Um, and, and, and we need to remember that as we, we continue to read. Let's move into verse two now. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, 
where he was put every day to beg from those going in to the temple courts. There is some interesting implication here, especially when we, when we go back and look at some of the Greek language that, uh, that Luke used here. Uh, Luke begins to add to the story by introducing the presence of a new player, this lame beggar. The word for lame is a, a Greek word, uh, cholos, C-H-O-L-O-S, and it, it means to literally be deprived of a foot or to be maimed in such a way that you were crippled and can no longer walk. So this is somebody that uh, either had a, a literally a, a leg chopped off or they, they were involved in some kind of accident or suffered from some kind of condition which literally prevented their leg or legs from working. Uh, today, we might, um, uh, um, we might refer to this person as, as, a, as somebody who is paralyzed. Um, uh, you know, if you're paralyzed from the waist down, you're not going to be able to walk. You're going to need assistance in that. And, and if, you're, if you're sitting down, you weren't going to get up unless somebody actually came and moved you. Now, so this person uh, had been like this since birth, and the man was being placed in the gate of the temple, referred to here as beautiful. Uh, this was the, this gate, this specific gate of the temple, was a was a main entrance, one of the main corridors uh, that led people into the temple courts. Many, many people would have passed through this gate each and every day. This is like the main entrance, the main doors. Um, you know, if you uh, if you go to a big uh, shopping mall, for instance, there are there's there's a lot of stuff inside, but there are specific main entrances, and most of the time, uh, a mall has a, a like the the main entrance, and there's normally like a food court or other things. And the highest percentage of people that enter the mall go through those gates. That was a similar uh, setting as to what's being described here. This was a main corridor. And, uh, and this person, it's interesting that the, the, the verbiage and the language here, um, this man was being carried to the temple gate where he was put every day. This, this is talking about that there was, he was placed there. The words behind this, it doesn't mean that this was a random, a random act. There, he was placed in this location, meaning there was a thought behind why this person would needed to be placed there. And then it goes on to say that, so that the people who were entering could give him money, could, could, get, could give him, and, and, and you know, he was begging, and, and they could then supply what he was begging for. The question is, why would somebody have carried this man here and placed him here? Um, now, uh, it was very likely that this person, and, and we, we can't know for sure this, but this, this is my own take on, on this. It was likely that this man was placed here by members of the temple court. At this time, uh, think about this, at this time it would have been a, uh, considered an act of great humility and piety for a person to give money to somebody who was in need. And uh, there were many people, including the Jewish leaders, who wanted the people to see just how humble they really were. Because of this, it was very likely that the people, uh, people who were like this lame beggar, would have been 
sort of strategically placed in high visibility areas, not only so that they would have the highest chance of receiving money, money that they truly needed, but I believe there. I believe that there was also a strategic point behind this, so that um, when someone did give to them, the highest number of people possible would see that act. It was a way to raise the public image of the giver. You can imagine, if you think about the, the, uh, the parable of the, or not the parable, the instance in, in which the, the widow woman gave her, her mite, her, her, little, um, her little coin. And it said, you know, the, the, the leaders went up and proudly gave money, but this, this poor woman gave all she had, a small amount. And Jesus said, I tell you, she has given more than all of them. They went up wanting to be seen for what they were doing. And I, I believe this is playing out right here. You can imagine the, the, the leaders coming up to this lame man and, and, oh, look at this lame person. And they, they pull out of their pockets and let me give all of this to this person. And, and, and people are watching them and saying, wow, look, look, at, uh, look at that teacher of the law. They're really sacrificing for this person. Now this passage notes that this specific man, this is the, the lame beggar that's the player in the story was placed here every day to beg. The importance of this is that if he was truly placed there every day, and we combine this with what we read in the first verse that Peter and John were went to the temple courts at the same time through the same passage every day, there would have been no doubt that Peter and John, along with everybody else that passed through that temple court every day, would have seen this man and he would have been known to them. They would have saw him there. They would have heard him begging before many, many times. He was probably a fixture of entering the, the gate beautiful. You know, to the point that people would have been, you know, oh man, I, you know, where were you actually yesterday? Well, I, I got all the way up to the temple court and by the, by the lame beggar, you know, where I'm talking about. And then I had to turn home and everybody would have said, oh yeah, you know, we know exactly where that is because we know it's who you're talking about. He was there every day. And, and so this was not the first time Peter and John had walked by. So having sort of set this stage now in verses three to five, we start getting into really the, the meat of what takes place. So we're gonna read verses three to five together. It says this, when he saw, when, when the lame beggar saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as John did. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Luke starts to describe the events that took place and he tells us that Peter and John saw this man, the man asked them for money, as, uh, as we've established before, this was probably something that had happened many, many times. They would walk, the man would say, oh, you know, money, money, money for the poor, I, you know, I crippled. And how many people every day would see that and, and walk right by, never even stopping to, to even hear, they, they probably heard the words, but just thought, oh, that's a lame beggar, all right. I'm almost, I'm almost there, good, I'm passing the lame beggar again. And, that was the extent of the thought that they gave to him. And, and the lame beggar was probably very used to that by this point. He just kind of had his little cup or whatever, and he was saying, you know, money, money, just not even making a real effort at this point. You, you see the scene play off in, in cities where, where you have people who are in need. They're, they're, they're just overlooked and, and often they don't even look, they just kind of hold it out. 
I, and I believe that's the scene that we have here. But something new happened on this particular day. It tells us that Peter and John both looked straight at him, straight at him. So th this was some, some, suddenly the same pattern was going every day and, and something different happened. They looked straight at him. This, this phrase actually comes from the Greek word at, atenizo, and it means to fix your gaze upon something, an object. It goes further to be described in this way, to fix one's mind on something as an example. When Peter and John looked straight at the man, it was clear that something was about to happen. Notice that definition, uh, to fix one's mind on something as an example. This wasn't just turning towards the, uh, the lame beggar to make a temporary or momentary eye contact or casually interacting with someone. There was a very specific and defined attention that came with this act of looking straight at the, uh, at the lame beggar, uh, really to the extent that it would have caught the attention of those standing around them. Like it, it wasn't just a, a thing that, you know, they walked over and were just kind of casually talking and looking. Um, <clears throat> it would have actually disrupted, I think, the regular flow of what was taking place. And, uh, and at this time, you, you can imagine everybody's just walking to, you know, to, and, and, and they're just going back and forth, and suddenly Peter just stops, and, and to the extent that other people walking were probably like, whoa, what's going on over here? You know, there's something different happening here. Peter gives some instruction to the man, not, not to just that they were looking intently, but he says, look at us. Uh, this phrase carries the same implication, like the same intent gaze that I'm looking at you right now, I want you to look at me the same way. Don't, don't, don't pay attention to what they're doing over there. Don't think about what you're gonna eat. Don't think about who, who gave you money. You put all your focus right now, right here. Look, at, look right here. Pay attention. And uh, the man <laughs> was probably shocked by this direct attention. I don't think there were, this happened very often that somebody would, would stop and, and interact with him in, in this level of uh, attention and, and focus. The man probably was likely excited and anticipated that something was indeed about to happen because uh, while it would not have been unusual for him to receive handouts, it would have probably been very unusual for him to be addressed directly in public like this. Remember, the, the act of giving to the lame man would have been viewed as a, a way to boost one's public image, but you also, you, you, you also didn't want to get too close. You wanted to keep a distance you didn't want to engage in a direct uh, relationship because if, if you got too friendly and, and you started to have too much of a relationship, that would kind of be viewed as, that would start to turn into that, wow, did, did you see who he was talking to? Why, why would he have a relationship with, with him? I mean, he's just a lame beggar. Why would he take time like that? There, there must be something off here. And, and so, this level of attention was something that would not have been, uh, not have been common, not, not have been the norm. And I think that's why I, I believe that there was this, this disrupted so many people around. They began to take note of what was about to happen, what God was about to do in this situation. Verse six says, then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. What a powerful statement. Peter, in an act of total obedience and submission to the Holy Spirit, speaks to the man, gives him a short description of the situation, followed by a single instruction. Peter first describes the situation that he and John are in. They did not have any money. Therefore, they were unable to give the man what he was probably hoping for and expecting. I believe that the man was probably sitting there and thinking, man, this, this, this could be really good. Like if these people are giving me this much attention and they're wanting people to really see it like that, they, they're probably getting ready to give me a pretty big gift. I believe when they first spoke, he might have felt a little sad when they said, money or gold and silver we do not have his heart might have okay they don't have any then what, what are we doing here like if you don't have anything to give me then why why are you talking to me but peter gave him an instruction that they were about to give him something that was of much more value than gold and silver and he gave him a one word instruction it, it wasn't a question. It, it wasn't uh, anything that was implied. It was a direct command. Peter said, walk. Peter didn't ask him for anything. He, 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 he simply required his attention and then asked him for obedience to what he told him to do. He essentially said, look at me and do this. Look at me and do this. Those were his two commands to the lame beggar. Look at me, walk. It's kind of hard to maybe comprehend this scene. Remember, the man had been strategically placed there so that many people would not only see him, but would also see the acts of uh, the people that were, the, the, the acts that the people were doing for him by giving. So there would have been many witnesses of this. Many people, remember this is the, the one of the busiest thoroughfares so a lot of people around, a lot of see people uh, seeing what was taking place. And what we see here is Peter stepping out in faith. We've probably all had those questions at some time. There's somebody that's in need before you. You feel a burden to pray for them and, and the question. Think about Peter, think about yourself in Peter's shoes. What if the man doesn't stand up? What if he tries to walk, but can't? What if I am made to look like a fool? What if I heard wrong and people see me making this scene and, and he just falls over and over and they say, <laughs> look at those silly apostles. What did they think was gonna happen? That guy can't walk, come on. And, and you know, they end up becoming a joke. I, I think that that is a very real uh, thought, a way that, that we can be intimidated. We know what the Lord has called us to do, and yet we struggle to believe if it will truly happen. Peter made an act of faith and spoke what the Lord was telling him to speak. That's it. He, he, he didn't calculate, well, maybe today's the good day. Maybe, you know, um, this might work out today. We should try it. Uh, no, it, it was a, a hearing, a process of hearing the Lord and then obeying what he has asked us to do. So this brings us to verse seven, a powerful verse. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Powerful. Peter requires the man to do nothing more, but Peter himself then takes action. 
Peter extends his arm to the man, takes him by the hand, and helps him to stand. Now, the, the method and the order in which this verse uh, describes these actions, I believe, has a lot of significance in this particular miracle that takes place. First, that we know the man was incapable of doing this on his own. He needed help, and it was Peter who made the effort to come alongside the man and help him up. Second, notice, notice very clearly the order here. The man's foot was not healed prior to standing up. It clearly tells us that he first stood up with the help of Peter and that after that happened, his feet and ankles were healed. So this was not only now an act of faith on the part of Peter, but it was also an act of faith now on the part of the lame beggar. He, he felt nothing before he stood up. It wasn't like when Peter said, you know, stand up, suddenly whoop, and his, his, his legs became strong, and he jumped up and was like, wow, I, I can stand up now. It required him to follow in obedience the instruction from Peter to receive help. And then when, 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 he, when he acted in obedience to do that, then that's when the Holy Spirit came and did a miracle in his life. When Peter took him by the hand, it was not simply an offer. It, it, uh, he didn't just come over and, you know, would you like help? The actual word that was used here, the Greek word, is the word piazo, piazo, P-I-A-Z-O, and it means to capture, literally means to apprehend and capture. And, and what's more interesting is that this word would have been uh, casually used. This, this is so cool. This was a word that would have been casually used to describe the act of catching a fish. You know, the, the guys would have been sitting around after the day out of the water and they would have made, man, I, when I, I piazzoed that, that one fish and it was great, like I, I caught it. Why is that interesting? Well, we of course know what did Jesus tell Peter the very first time that he met him. He said, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And here Luke describes what took place as Peter just like casting that, 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 that line out and grabbing down and hooking it, and he is bringing in the catch. Peter, I will make you a fisher of men. And here, Peter is reaching down to do the work. It's, it's a, a beautiful fulfillment, this little word, a beautiful fulfillment of that promise and, and, a, and a very obvious description of what was taking place. This also tells us that when the man stood up, the healing took place immediately. There was no other action needed. There were no other steps and there, were, there was no uh, need for a natural healing or any regeneration of muscle, muscle and tissue. It happened this way into sort of the flash of an eye. In one second, he was lame, he, was, he couldn't walk, he was just holding on to Peter. And the next second, boom, he was made strong. When you look at that word in, in verse seven, and instantly, this, this is that twinkling of an eye, the man's feet and ankles became strong. a miraculous thing happened and, and the people around saw it. We're gonna go into verse eight and then we'll, we'll finish here after verse eight. Verse eight, he jumped to his feet 
and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. This, there, there's something interesting to extract here because it describes the man's reaction after having just experienced that momentary healing in his legs. As indicated in verse two, this man had been in this condition since birth. Not only was he unable to walk, he had never walked. And uh, yet here we see that the man that wasn't only physically healed in this moment, but the Lord had imparted something into his mind as well. Think about this. It says that he jumped to his feet and began to walk. He had never learned before in his life how to walk. He had never practiced walking, yet he jumped to his feet and immediately took off along with Peter and John, dancing and running and jumping. Now you can, you can imagine anybody that has had a small child, when they first begin to learn to use their legs, they do not immediately stand up and run and jump and dance and, and all these things. It takes weeks and months and, and even years to learn to really run and to learn to dance and to jump. And yet, in the same instantaneous way that his, his physical legs were strengthened and healed, he was imparted with a supernatural understanding and, and sort of programming in his mind of how to operate this newly healed body part. I think it shows us that the healing that God wants to bring to us is, is not just a physical healing, it's an emotional and mental healing ourselves. He, he seeks to heal our whole being, to, to completely put into us what we need to make us a whole person in him. I think that should be very encouraging to us today that, that he doesn't just look at that one need, but he, he looks at us holistically. He loves us holistically and he wants to heal us holistically. And there's only one way that that can occur through the name of Jesus Christ and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we're gonna leave off today there in verse eight. We're gonna come back next week and, and pick up in verse nine. And uh, as we do that, let me go ahead and close us out in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we give you the praise and the glory for, for what we're reading about right now, Father, that you love us so much that you seek to heal our lives physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, every way. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that as people hear this and, and, and Father, as, as we have heard, Lord, that, that you will do that in our lives, Father. Bring us to a place of completion and wholeness in you. Father, we give you thanks. We ask for your blessing on all that happens today. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, everybody, God bless. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you back next week. Amen.